permanent recognition and tribute to Russell E. Dietrich Jr. for his monumental contribution to the game of baseball and to the renovation and improvements to the College Stadium baseball facility, College Stadium is hereby rededicated and shall hereafter be known as Russell E. Dietrich Jr. Park. What a special night for a special guy, Russell E. Dietrich, Jr. As the program stated, when you arrived, you entered College Stadium. When you leave, you'll be exiting Russell E. Dietrich, Jr. Park. And this is just the latest of the many parks which have served professional baseball so well since 1890. Let's take a glance at where we came from. Our first ballpark was located between 8th and 11th Street near the boat landing. It was known as Marvin Park. It was a converted horse track and there are only a few pictures of it in existence. This 1891 picture shows the ballpark in the foreground. The professional team was known as just simply the James Downers, and they played in 1890 and 1891. The difficulty was the field would often be flooded, and it was subject to the whims of a farmer named Warner who had a dam downstream, and when he would not open up the dam, there would be flooding and the games would have to be postponed. 1890 team, the first professional team in Jamestown, was the pennant winning champions of the New York and Pennsylvania League. This was not its only distinction. The first professional baseball team in Jamestown contained a black first baseman named R.A. Kelly. At a time when blacks were generally banned in baseball, whether major leagues or minor leagues, Jamestown not only tolerated but encouraged Kelly, who for two years was one of the stars of this team. Here's the outlet as it looked in 1891. And up at the upper end of the outlet is a ball field. Professional baseball reappeared in 1895 thanks to the commencement of something extraordinary on Chautauqua Lake, Celeron Park. As part of its ongoing activities, professional baseball reappeared in the Iron and Oil League, and one of its first games was on August 20th, 1895. Among the highlights that year was the appearance by a young third baseman playing on the Warren, Pennsylvania team. 
known as Hannes Wagner. His first year in professional baseball right here in Chautauqua County. Celeron Park entertained professional baseball in the year 1895, 1898, which included the Celeron representative a, being an all-black team, being the last all-black team in professional baseball until Jackie Robinson came on the scene and integrated Major League Baseball in 1946. The outfield was surrounded by Chautauqua Lake, and often cars would be found parking in the outfield. Professional baseball reappeared in 1914 and 1915, with the 1915 manager being Billy Webb. Subsequently, after the league folded, Billy Webb would create a semi-pro team well known in the area as Billy Webb's Spiders. Finally, in 1939, the first year of the Pony League found the Jamestown entry affiliated with the Pittsburgh Pirates playing in Celeron Park. The park was in a very difficult condition and would leave t lead to the Pirates leaving the next year. It's over the many years when baseball was played at Celeron Park, but none more than in 1921 when the Bambino, Babe Ruth, played an exhibition game here. On the base swing, it's a long run, a long run going out toward right center. Thing was backing up against the wall. He can't get it. It's in there. Another home run for the Bambino. So the Bay hits his second home run.
Field line here. Right there's where the stadium grandstands were. We pan back and we see the right field line. Towards the lake, where the roller coasters once were. Currently standing at what would have been about Pitcher's Mound. And we look our way out towards center field, and we see the Trees, which allegedly Babe Ruth and others tried to hit over and into the lake, now dotted by the Ellicott Shores apartments. The field was ringed by the lake itself. In the winter of 1939, bad news hit Jamestown baseball fans. The Pittsburgh Pirates, as they had telegraphed, made the decision to leave Jamestown because of the difficult conditions at Selron Park, and they moved their club to London, Ontario. Left with no team, the city remained hopeful that when the league expanded to eight teams, Jamestown would once again be in the baseball business. On June 5, 1940, reports from Niagara Falls mentioned that because of poor attendance, owner Harry Bisgeier, seen second from the right, would move to Jamestown if proper facilities were made available. Bisgeier was aware of the drive by Jamestown to raise funds for a new stadium. The fund drive was proving successful, and on July 3rd, Niagara Falls announced its plan to move to Jamestown on July 19th. It was on that day, the first game at the interim park at Allen Park of professional baseball in Jamestown. Among the superstars was Johnny Newman, here hitting a blast at Allen Park in a very rare picture. Notice the goalpost in left field for soccer. Johnny Newman hitting a home run down this left field line and notice the trees as they've grown since 1940. Here's a look at Allen Park 60 years later. The home of the 1940 Pony League representative.
In the 1930s and 1940s, Allen Park was a hotbed of baseball activity. Here's a picture of the Class A championship team, Ed's Bread, of October 1938. Allen Park, 2000, now used for softball and soccer. Home plate, first base. The left field, Johnny Newman fame. Since 1941, more than two and a half million fans have heeded the advice of Harry Carey and have clicked the turnstiles to see the stars of tomorrow. Over 100 Jamestown players have graduated to the big show, with Nellie Fox being the only one to go from Jamestown to Cooperstown. What was the backdrop which permitted this jewel to be built in Jamestown, New York? The Jamestown Evening Journal of Tuesday, May 6, 1941, gives two big stories. The excitement of the dedication of the new stadium. And the ever-present war which is occurring over in Europe, which to date, America has been able to keep out of.
the headlines are interspersed between baseball and German and Nazi invasion. Such were the winds of war which were circulating in the early down there. And it was just like I've never left. You walk into that stadium. And you know that stadium looks just exactly as it did. When was that stadium built? Forty one. Forty one. Forty one. <coughs> yeah. It was good it was built that year, wasn't it? Because <coughs> following year they wouldn't have uh, they wouldn't have put up the money for it okay. because of the war. That's probably right. They couldn't have got, gotten bricks for it. The ball of bricklayers would be off training someplace. But uh <laughs> Between 1940 and 1950, penicillin was introduced, and the atom was split. Orson Welles made his masterpiece, Citizen Kane. Rogers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma opened on Broadway. And Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected president a third time and a fourth. Overshadowing everything was a world war that would cost more than 55 million lives. has seen many of the greats and near greats. This particular picture is unique because in the foreground and center field is Hall of Famer Nellie Fox, and on the mound is Jamestown's own Lyle Parkhurst. During the same game, with Parkhurst pitching, Fox in center field, and the famous Moose scoreboard. This is 1944. Municipal Stadium became known as College Stadium at the time when the city of Jamestown transferred title to the campus to Jamestown Community College. The College Stadium has seen some tremendous activities. One of the largest attendance occurred in the late 1990s, not during a professional league game, but during a Babe Ruth League game, when the Jamestown host team had success. Here's a couple of scenes.
One of the most memorable professional baseball games at the College Stadium occurred September 2nd, 1994. It was the last regularly scheduled game of the season, and it pitted Jamestown against Batavia. Going into the bottom of the ninth, Jamestown was down 3-2. to two. The team that won this game would go on to the playoffs. A full house played before all the brass of the Buffalo Bisons, including Bob and Mindy Rich, made it extra special. Here to the bottom of the ninth with one out, down three to two. On August 9th, 1997, College Stadium became a memory. As the program indicated, when you arrived, you entered College Stadium. When you leave, you will be exiting Russell E. Dietrich Jr. Park. May there be many more memories to come.
Kiwi is this extraordinary individual who has been acclaimed by one and all as Mr. Baseball. Let's learn more. Look at that eye. That eye on you. I was born in Patton, Pennsylvania, which is down in well, probably the central part of the state. Better known a few miles from Johnstown, Pennsylvania, where the Johnstown floods were. Mm -hmm. sort of locates it in the, in the state. Came to Jamestown when I was five years old. The family moved here because my father had been a coal miner, and the coal mines were petering out, so he came to Jamestown to find work, and we had families here. Uh, I guess you want to tie that to baseball and why I have an interest in it. I guess it was the, either in the water or in the air. I was born on October 9, 1934. And that was a year, of course, the Tigers and the Cardinals were mm -hmm. in the World Series. And October 9th, I think, was the last day of the series. And uh, uh, as I was waiting to come, and on that day when I was being born, my mother, during that World Series, as in other times, was keeping box scores over the radio <laughs> for my father when he would come home from the coal mines. So uh, I was born in the midst of all of that, so they all said that's why I had to be a baseball fanatic. Who won? Uh, Cardinals won that series. That's the year the Dean brothers won two games each. It started me uh, to be a baseball fan. It didn't hurt me. I guess that my father was a Yankee fan or a baseball fan in those days, and my grandfather was a, a Pittsburgh Pirate fanatic uh, during those times, living in Pennsylvania. And he had a lifestyle that, uh, as a in his uh, middle part of his life, as a uh, professional person, as an undertaker, so he had time and dollars to get involved, so he was always involved in the amateur baseball program and had an interest in the Pirates and had an interest in pit football and all those kind of things, so it, it came natural, I guess. Like any other kid you know, growing up in Jamestown, I uh, was interested in, in sports, but uh, baseball primarily. Uh, in those days, we played baseball from the time before the snow went off the sidewalk until it come back again. We used to shovel bare spots in the ground to play catch or we'd go to school walking down each side of the sidewalk playing catch uh, on our way to school. And after school, we'd be playing ball at Lincoln or Charles Street or wherever school that you know, we were attending. And everybody was doing that. That was the, the sport to be, to be part of, at least for the neighborhood kids. And got involved in the city rec leagues at the age of about seven or six and played in those programs like everybody else was doing and enjoyed being part of that. Enjoyed it so much that I used to play in one division higher and manage and coach in a division lower than that. And so we were at the baseball field every day. We'd go down to Lincoln, 7 o'clock in the morning, and skip lunch. And uh, my father would come down and uh, encourage me to go home for supper and then let me come back until after dark. And that went on day after day after day. And there was about 60 or 50 of us that was doing that. And that was going on in all the ballparks. It just wasn't Lincoln. It was uh, Fletcher and it was Washington and Jefferson. Yeah, baseball was part of your junior high school life at a league in junior high school, so uh, it was there for all of us to do that. Uh, that got me to be involved a couple summers uh, for the city recreation department as working as an umpire, umpired in the junior leagues on the various fields, so here again it was, it was more baseball. Uh, played a little bit of baseball in high school, uh, kept that interest up and graduated in 1952 went to work at Mount Rockwell Corporation. They had a fine semi-pro baseball team, as a lot of industries did. Uh, I'm thinking of Jamestown Finishing Products, uh, Steel Partition Bombers, and just a whole host of other teams. At one time, there were 16 teams in the uh, semi-pro league here that played weekdays at College Stadium. And then there was eight teams about that played what they called the New York Penn semi-pro league played on weekends. Salamanca and Bradford and Oleand and Jamestown and, uh, uh, and the Warren State Hospital had a field. In fact, Jamestown represented them for many years, uh, playing as the North Warren field. So there was enough and a lot of baseball for everybody to participate in. Here again, we started uh, before the snow went off the ground and uh, they played all summer long. Sometimes those guys would play 100 games in the summer. And uh, being part of that was close to that. Uh, not having the skill to be one of the nine or one of the starting pitchers all the time, I kind of drifted more and more to the management and the organizational end of it and got involved with Bob Kerr, who was a uh, supervisor at Monterey Rockwell and uh, managed and operated their baseball team there. 
and worked with him and eventually uh, mm -hmm. took that position uh, when he was no longer able to do that. Uh, then in 1958, the opportunity came that uh, the then assistant recreation director in the city of Jamestown, Tex Dane, resigned his position. The then director of recreation, Jim Sharp, asked if I would be interested in working as an assistant recreation director, uh, doing baseball, softball, and athletic programs evenings and weekends. And uh, I was uh, fortunate enough and able enough to uh, do that, and do that while I was still working at Modern Rockwell. Uh, through 1964. Being one of the stadium rats and hanging around the stadium as a youngster, that also kept us close to what was going on. So then in the 1960s, uh, there was a group of people who got together and took over uh, the operation of the Jamestown baseball team and uh, was asked to be part of that and worked very closely with Eric Guggen and Marty Haynes and uh, Jules Newhouse and uh, Lou Shepard, or just a whole host of people during those years that uh, took the baseball team over. So I got involved uh, there uh, while still working for the city of Jamestown. The administrations asked if I, you know, if I would uh, help represent the city of Jamestown as, as far as the stating was concerned and the operations uh, with the, the Major League Baseball team. So I worked at direct correlation most of that time with those, uh, those uh, teams and those organizations. And uh, you know, that's going on continuously uh, in and out of or close to the, the professional program here. Uh, suffered through the 50s uh, when baseball was struggling and in the 60s when baseball, my minor league baseball was struggling. I remember uh, one, uh, when we, a group of us got together after Jamestown had struggled for a few seasons and they, uh, the then organizers dropped the franchise and it was going to fold up. I think the figure was about $48,000. They had an outstanding bills and they had no revenues. Uh, so when uh, the group of uh, fellows got together, uh, it was Eric Guggen and Lou Shepard and Marty Haynes and uh, a few other people, we, we took the program together and we uh, then created a what we call a sustaining membership and people in the community donated uh, money not only for tickets but also to, to, to help the organization. And within inside of about a year and a half, we paid off that total debt, uh, dollar for dollar. And that was money owed for balls and bats and umpires. and. Uh, bus transportation and motels. What year was this for us? That, uh, that had to be about 1969, 68, in, in around that period. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we were able to, to hang on, keep it going. Uh, attendance was low in those days. Uh, for what reason? You know, across the nation, they, I remember they used to blame it on television. They blamed it on a lot of different things. We, s we had very little money, so we spent very little money on promotions. Uh, most of the money we took in had to go for balls and bats and umpires and uh, the necessary things. Uh, but we, we kept it alive. There was a group of uh, three people uh, who took a financial interest uh, and really helped out. Uh, two of those was, uh, and I'm sure I can use her names, Eric Guggen, who is no longer with us, and Dr. Eugene Foley. and. Uh, we used to, at the end of the year, uh, divide up the debt three ways and uh, pay the bills so we could get going for the next year. Uh, they were, I think, very important years for mm -hmm. it, to keep baseball alive. It could have easily uh, folded as it did, uh, you know, for a period. And that went on uh, through uh, about 1973. Then in 1974, uh, we just uh, we couldn't keep we couldn't keep it alive. We couldn't keep it going. And the baseball went out of being in Jamestown for about uh, three or four years. And uh, a businessman from I believe about South Dayton, Cliff Farnham, who was, a, he was an insurance agent for Equitable Insurance here in town, uh, came in the office one day in the recreation department and just wanted to know why there was not base professional baseball in Jamestown. So after sitting down and explaining the problem and uh, getting people to do it and people who had time and able to generate the dollars, she said, oh, I've, I'll be happy to work on it and try to help bring it back. So I said, well, the next thing we needed to do was to find a franchise. So I uh, had a long-lasting friendship with Jim Fanning, who was then vice president of the Montreal Expos. Picked up telephone, talked to Jim for a while, and uh, they were able to get together, Mr. Farnham and he, and uh, you know, they did come back to Jamestown. They brought baseball back. And uh, it has been here ever since. There has not been a break. 77? 77, yes, I think that was.
the idea of a community event for Russ Dietrich was hatched by Bonnie and Chuck. They asked me if I was interested and would I like to involve myself. I said, sure, why not? After all, Russ Dietrich was the first man that ever interviewed me for a job. He was the first man to ever hire me for a summer job. I, he was the first person I ever asked for a reference when I went to college. Somebody had to write some references, and Russ was number one on my list. He was also the first person to tell me it was OK when I was 12 years old not to have found an Easter egg during the Easter egg hunt. <laughs> Especially when I told him this was the eighth year in a row I had not found one. <laughs> now, this guy's resume. And it was all of seven and a half pages of what this guy has done. And she remarked, it's only a partial resume. I'd hate to see the whole thing. But anyways, I think it's probably, I will not read the whole resume. I'll not even read half the resumes. But perhaps some of the highlights to put into a perspective what this guy has meant to Jamestown in various manners. Some statistics. He was born October 9th, 1934. Quickly, how old is he? I already told you earlier the big announcement, he's married to June. As you know, he was the, uh, has been with the city of Jamestown since 1958, and has been the director of recreation from 1964 through 1994. Did you know that he won uh, the National Conference of Christian Jews Golden Achievement Medallion in 1986? Did you know he was inducted into the Chicago Sports Hall of Fame in 1982? Were you aware that in 1977, he was the boss of the year, by the, elected by the New York State Division of National Secretaries? That in 1976, King Carl Gustav of Sweden gave him a special award. He was awarded the Outstanding Educator in America. He received the Brotherhood Citation of the National Conference of Christians and Jews. He was the Sports Personality of the Year of the St. John's Holy Name Society back in 1963. He's been the past president of a variety of associations. Some of them, and there's four pages worth, the 100, 100 Member Club, the Christmas Friendship Club, and board members of the Chautauqua County Council of Alcoholism, Jamestown Meals on Wheels, Beautification and Ecology Committee, Chautauqua Institution 55 plus weekend planning committee, and on and on and on. But we know his real love is baseball. And for years he was involved with the Jamestown Furniture City baseball as a director and a president. For those who had an opportunity to look along the side wall earlier, you may have seen his autograph on a few checks. Russ, believe me when I tell you, uh, being a sports nut myself, but for Russ, we would not have professional baseball in Jamestown, New York. He not only was an active solicitor of major league clubs bringing in minor league franchises into Jamestown, but there was a time when in fact uh, the franchise was owned by a local corporation and at the end of the year when things got tough and somebody had to balance the budget, there was a guy like Russ Dietrich there. Utterly phenomenal. You guys would never know this. Russ uh, would never share that with you. He's a humble guy, but a guy who makes things happen. More about that later. As you know, he's been actively involved in Babe Ruth, as obviously that's his new job. But in, prior to that, he was a host president for a variety of Babe Ruth World Series committees. As you can see in my back here, various banners. Again, this is in Jamestown because of what Russ has meant to Babe Ruth. Um, we're blessed. We're blessed. Not only is the founder, but the past president of the Chautauqua Sports Hall of Fame. I'm personally gratified as the president of the Chautauqua Region Community Foundation that I have board as a board member of Russ Teacher. We're thrilled to have a guy like Russ in our presence. And that's some of the cold hard facts about Russ Teacher. There's for those who want to look, there's seven pages full of that of those items. Now let's talk about the human side of Russ Teacher. What's this? <laughs> Wait a minute. This isn't on the program. Folks, I apologize. 
Thought you got rid of me, didn't you? Yes. Thought I had a key to the door. They didn't lock the door tonight. They let me in. For those of you who don't know who I am, through previous engagements, Mr. Dietrich had a son. And if you think Roselli's going to be long... <laughs> I want to hear this. Oh, you people make me sick. <laughs> You're making him out to be some sort of god. Well, I'm here to straighten things out. Where's Harry Smith? <laughs> the man just doesn't shut up. You ever been downtown? You sit there and say, hi, Russ, how you doing? Half hour later, you're still not sure. <laughs> ever tried to talk to him downtown? You sit there and you say, hi, Russ, how are you? One old lady comes up. Hi, Russ, how are you? An old man comes up. Hello, Russ, how are you? Everybody comes up and says, hi, Russ. You're still not sure if you're talking to him or not. You're just part of a big crowd that came down there. <laughs> the first time I heard the man speak, I was sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, this guy is really good. Eloquent, uses all the right words, the whole nine yards. He even has a little bit of magic with him. You know, you, you sit there and you, you know when Tinkerbell comes on those Peter Pan movies, you hear that little jingling sound? I'm listening to him speak and I'm waiting for Santa Claus to come out because I hear the sh -sh 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 -sh. <laughs> Let me tell you a secret. When he's got change in his pocket, that's what it is. He's playing with the change in his pocket. Let me tell you another secret. The Babe Ruth World Series Committee knows that. If he's got $1.75 or more in his pocket, it's worth at least 45 minutes of speech. And that's the truth. What Bonnie has found, and also Chuck Tilford has found, if you go up to him before a speech and ask him for change for a dollar, the speech is a lot shorter. <laughs> I remember I was there the night that the Tigers played. Uh, uh, that was an exciting time for a young ball player. Uh, is that the Dizzy Trout? The Dizzy, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I can have two memories of that. Uh, I can remember that Dizzy Trout uh, he struck uh, Clem Kishorek out with a rosin bag. Uh, uh, the crowd went crazy. And uh, I remember my dad and I were leaving, leaving the stadium in the car, and the door burst open. I had no idea what was happening. And it was Dizzy Trout running a, wanting a ride uptown. And uh, we got, I think, out on Faulkner Street heading for uptown, and he saw somebody else. And he said, thank you, and he jumped out of the car and went to... Uh, I don't know was it one of the other ball players walking or just exactly what it was, but uh, <laughs> yeah, a short time that he was riding in the back of the car. And, uh. In 1967, you joined with the other presidents of the New York Penn League to enter into the experimental short season. Why was that? Yeah, I believe that's right. Yes. Why was that? Well. The major leagues were looking uh, at the help with the player development contracts. We were, especially in James and uh, NYP League, the Pony League, uh, we were having trouble that early season. Weather was a, weather was a fright, and the, the costs uh, were going on and on and on. They were unable to put people in the ballpark. The weather was bad, and then the major leagues were looking for a place to uh, put uh, some of their June drafts and some of their college draft people. And through that, those kinds of problems, uh, the concept of the short season come along. Short season, I think, was one of the things that really saved professional baseball in Jamestown. I think we had to struggle with uh, starting in April and all of that bad weather and uh, all of the costs going on and uh, the amount of players that the major leagues uh, you know, had that they had to uh, assign to these minor league teams. Uh, if for some reason we'd have stuck to the long season, uh, it would have been a lot tougher. Yeah. I think I think it was a salvation to the, uh, especially the, the northern Class A leagues. On those same lines, Dave was asking about what your recall, recollection may be as to the institution of the designated hitter rule. 
Apparently, we were. James, uh, NY, opponent of the NYP League was the Experimental League. Uh, Vince McNamara sat, he was the president of the league, sat in on the National Rules Committee. And of course, when they were writing the rule books and uh, you know, doing some kind of experimentations, uh, uh, they were asked in, the, uh, in our league to uh, be the, uh, the test case for the designated hitter. And that's where it all began. I know at our league meetings there was a. Uh, I'd have to go back and look in the league records, but I don't think it passed by too many votes. There was a lot of the purists that wanted nothing to do with it. They just thought it was so foreign to baseball and it was going to make a mockery of it. And you know, why should we be the test case? And uh, as in years, uh, you know, we were the test case for some of the uh, the lady umpires and stuff. And uh, there was that same kind of feeling. Was it was it received? Did you get a sense of the fans? Was there any, any recollection as to? Well, I. Uh, I think the fans were pretty much as split as the uh, the, the franchises in the league. Uh, uh, the purest, uh, the baseball fan, the purest, uh, you know, just thought it was a mockery and they were going to ruin the game. They were going to take the game out of the hands of the manager because uh, the you know, pitcher didn't have to bat and it wasn't going to change the game as far as bunting and sacrifice and when you were going to take the pitcher out and how you were going to handle your relief pitchers. And, but then there were some that, uh, you know, had visions of, of what it might do. It caused some more excitement in the ball game. It caused more hitting in the ball game. And uh, uh, I'm not sure they realized it was going to extend a lot of uh, careers yeah. in in the major leagues. It wasn't so much that. Uh, and then, of course, there were some of the farm directors weren't all that supportive because you know they were the players were here to train and the players were here to develop. And like in the case of Jim Rooker, who uh, they started as an outfielder, they, they turned him into a pitcher, but there were a lot of them that started as pitchers, and with their hitting ability, uh, it, they, they went into the infield and the outfield, and a lot of them were discovered in minor league baseball. In 1968, Jamestown was associated with the Boston Red Sox, and you were the president of the club. Tell me about these two who would wind up in the major leagues big time. That's when I was in, involved uh, as a, one of the hands-on people at the stadium. And uh, that's when we used to have to buy all the balls and all the bats. And uh, it got down to the end of the season, and uh, Cecil Cooper and Ben Ogilvy come in late in the season. Uh, came at the same time. So we had to order bats for them. So I ordered, uh, I think I probably ordered about 18 bats apiece for them at that time. And uh, we finished on the road that year. So I remember I went into the into the locker room because we we the Jamestown operation bought the bats. We used to personalize them. It had the name Cooper. Or they'd have the name Peterson. Whoever was stamped on the bat uh, ordered to their model size. So go. I went through the locker room and uh, we were getting ready to put stuff away for the end of the season. And uh, they had all been they were on the road, but their extra bats were there, and especially Cooper and uh, Ogilvy because we had bought so many of them. So I went through to pick out the bats. We used them for batting practice the, the ne next season. And uh, they had a full dozen of bats uh, left behind. So I took, uh, left two bats uh, back in each one of their lockers, uh, you know, as souvenirs for them. That's where they'd be playing them when they got back. And I remember they came into the office uh, after they got back and packed and ready to go. And they said, somebody's been in the locker room and uh, we can't find our bats. I said, what do you mean you can't find your bats? Well, we had some extra, we had a box of bats in there and they're gone and we don't know who took them. And I said, well, I'll share with you, I took them. And went on to explain to them why that, you know, we had to pay for the bats and what we would use, we'd use those bats next year uh, for spring training uh, and the old balls, et cetera. And we had a little discussion. I said, well, you know, there's two bats back there. If you need another one uh, as a souvenir, I think I remember I give them another bat. Kept the rest. Uh, never did I know at that time that both of them would be major leaguers and have the great careers great that they did. If I'd have known that, I'd have probably given them all the bats in the locker room. Uh, in 1970, the manager for the Jamestown Falcons was Jackie Jensen, who in the long line of major league managers was probably its biggest name to manage here in Jamestown. Having played with the New York Yankees in the early 50s, the Senators, and achieved much acclaim in Boston from 1954 through 1961, including leading the American League in RBIs on three separate occasions. What was Jackie Jensen like? Here being his first and I believe his only pro season as a manager. You know, because 
with him every day, hands on with Jackie Jensen, uh, uh, in awe that he was, you know, who he was. Uh, he did not play that role in this year. He's very much down to earth and uh, spent most of the time talking about you and other people instead of Jackie. But you could get him into conversation. I remember I had a conversation with him about his fear of flying in an airplane and uh, uh, he had brought his wife and so I know we had socialized a few times with he and his wife after games and uh, rain out games. So I got, got close to him then. Uh, Jackie was a uh, he was a major leaguer coaching in the minor leagues, and that was hard for him. Uh, the bus trips were hard for him. Uh, the small meal money was hard for him. Uh, the locker room that he had down at the old stadium, if it would rain, he'd come back in the next morning, it'd be four inches of rain on the floor. That was hard for him. Uh, uh, with good talent, uh, worked well with the ball players, worked well in the community. I mean, he wasn't one to run off and hide after the game was over. He was, he was visible and uh, just a very, very pleasant person. Very thing. Oh, well, it was on the entrance. It was a personality, uh, Lefty Gomez, who worked for Wilson Sporting Goods. And the leagues that used the Wilson ball, it was part of his responsibility to go into the towns and uh, you know, promote Wilson products and uh, to be supportive of the baseball. And I remember he came to town one night and it was a rainy night. In fact, the game got rained out eventually. But it started to rain uh, just as getting ready to play ball and Lefty come and he sat in the grandstand. And uh, after about 20 minutes, uh, we decided we had to cancel the game. And it was a pretty full grandstand, and uh, some people in the bleachers. And so, you know, I was going to be it, and the lefty says, oh, you know, we don't, we're, gonna, we're not going to shut down. So he asked for the microphone. And we took the microphone down from up in the press box and fished the wire down to the screen, and he s took the microphone and he invited everybody to come into the grandstand. And he sat there for well over an hour, probably an hour and a half. And... Uh, Kep House, and he just told baseball stories of his time with Babe Ruth, his memories in the major leagues, and I, I think a lot of stories he made up as he went along that night, but he just, you know, to see that Hall of Famer sit there and do that for his love of baseball and his commitment to the Wilson Sporting Goods people and his commitment to the Pony League, uh, uh, it was exciting when it was going on, but as years went on, it meant more and more and more to us. And then... Uh, the other thing that I was able to enjoy, and that doesn't seem to happen today, is the the, ball, the players that played professionally, something we talked about earlier, would, would play in Jamestown, and then when their career would stop, uh, they would then seem to gravitate back to Jamestown to pick up their life. A lot of them married Jamestown girls, a lot of them got jobs in Jamestown, and you know, just made outstanding citizens. And I don't know whether that happened. I wasn't always going to try to look into that somehow, whatever research process would be uh, doable. but. Just find out that happened in all of the minor leagues, or that it happened just a lot here in Jamestown. But uh, well, there were 15, 20 of those fellows that come back to Jamestown. And we're able the very thought of you, and I forget to do. The little ordinary things that everyone ought to do. I'm living in a kind of daydream. I'm happy as a king.
great pleasure to officially induct you into the Babe Ruth Baseball Hall of Fame, presented to Russell E. Dietrich, Jr., in recognition of election into the Babe Ruth Baseball Hall of Fame for outstanding services and contributions to Babe Ruth League Incorporated, 1997. I guess the young people today feel that this is the right time to be involved. But uh, it was a golden opportunity for somebody who was so interested and in, you know, so in, uh, worship baseball like uh, myself to be to be part of that and to be close to it. It's, uh, it's been a blessing. Yeah. I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't change any of it. Well, I was lucky enough as one of those kids on the playground, uh, you know, to be able to play and hold your end up. Uh, you know, as a 10 and 12 and 15 and 16 year old, and then when the talent kind of ran ahead of you, was able not to sever myself from baseball, but to, to stay involved uh, by carrying water and selling programs and uh, sweeping the stands and doing all the things that a general manager does, and uh, was able to get involved in that. Otherwise, you know, in my, uh, I just wouldn't have had the, all of these opportunities.
I'm Kristen Stein, Director of the Fenton History Center in Jamestown, New York. We hope you've enjoyed this presentation, which is just one of many stories from our community's rich history. The Fenton History Center preserves our shared history through the presentation of educational programs and exhibits, the maintenance of a collection of local artifacts and archival materials, and a library specializing in local history and genealogy, all for the benefit and use of the public. For more information about the Fenton History Center and its activities, call 664-6256.